Love is such an interesting word in our culture. It's such an interesting thing that has kind of a spectrum of meaning, right? Love can mean some extreme intimacy, but it also can mean you kind of like something. So I am head over heels in love with my wife. I mean, she is the greatest thing this side of heaven to me. I love her, but I also love Doritos. I mean, right, like there's, right, we're, we're like kind of, the, the word love kind of fits into that context. We use it, we kind of say that, but I hope one means something else and more than the other, right? And so this word love, spectrum of understanding, but in this phrase that we'll hear around, there's a spectrum of meaning. So have you heard this? If you love me, you will dot, 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 right? So we'll hear people say that. That phrase has a spectrum of meaning, right? So if a seventh grade girl says to a seventh grade boy, if you love me, you won't look at another girl. Okay, we're hearing something from you. Like we know what you're trying to say, but that's kind of different, right? Than if you're in a committed relationship, husband and wife, you've been married for years, and you say to your spouse, if you love me, you will. Different, right? But even in a marriage, in an intimate relationship, in a committed relationship, if you say to your spouse, if you love me, you will, buy me a BMW today, right? That's not love, that's manipulation, right? You're like, dang, I was gonna use that. That's not love, that's manipulation. But if you're committed to one another and your spouse says to you, if you love me, you will respect me. If you love me, you will listen and try to understand me. Your spouse is trying to say to you what love looks like, what love means, what love is defined by. In an intimate relationship, you want to hear someone say to you, if you love me, let me explain what that looks like. Jesus makes an if you love me, you will statement in John chapter 14. I would love for you to open your Bibles, turn them on, Go there with me, John 14, verse 15. Jesus makes this, if you love me, you will statement that if you're considering a relationship with Jesus, if you want to walk with Jesus, if you're even curious about the kingdom of God, you'll listen to this statement that Jesus makes because it defines what a relationship with him looks like. So we've been in John Jesus is sitting down in John 13, 14, 15. He's sitting down with his disciples at a meal. They're eating together. It's the Last Supper, which means just hours from now, Jesus is going to be arrested. He's going to be tortured and killed. And he's speaking these truths to this group of guys, intimate circle of 12, sharing with them these last things that are on his mind before he dies. He says to them in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, he says to them, keep my commands. Now, this is not what I would expect Jesus to say at the Last Supper. This is a really important meal. It's really important. And he's giving them these final words and says this. And to me, it strikes me as kind of odd for two reasons. First, if Jesus is really God, then it's as if God is coming over the megaphone to the entire human race saying, hey everybody, if you love me, keep my commands. Uh, that sounds odd to me, because I would think that God would say, if you love me, serve me. If you love me, worship me. If you love me, sacrifice for me. If you love me, clean up your act, clean up your mouth, clean up your behavior, your attitude. If you love me, be more holy, be more spiritual. But that's not what God says through Jesus. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. Interesting. I think it's interesting because Jesus is God in the flesh, and to say to a bunch of dudes, if you love me, is a little too mushy-gushy intimate, in my mind, for a group of guys sitting around the table. Like, I would think he would say, guys, if you believe in me, keep my commands. If you respect me, follow what I say. If you fear me, 
If you want to follow me, but love, like as a guy, love is reserved for my wife and my kids, not a bunch of dudes, and certainly not God. Like, I don't know if I love God or not, really. And yet, when you read the Bible, you learn that love is at the foundation of every relationship for God. Like, this is bedrock for God. Everything is built on a foundation of love. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, this Trinity existed for all eternity in an intimate, loving relationship with one another. And it's out of their love that they create people to share their love with. And while we have all kinds of thoughts about what love means and the definition of love and the spectrum of love, does it mean like, does it mean intimacy, all this thing, the Bible says God is love. The Bible defines what love is. For God so loved the world that He gave His Son. First John 4 says, this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and He showed it. He sent His one and only Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So, so for God, love is the motivation behind everything He does. It's the bedrock behind all His decision-making, all His strategy, all His actions, all His attitudes. It's always about love. So context here. Jesus, again, is hanging out with His disciples. He says, if you love Me, you will keep My commands. He says that here in John 14. Remember earlier, John 13, this is the Last Supper. What happens at the beginning of the Last Supper? Jesus gets down on his hands and knees and washes a bunch of dirty dudes' feet, right? These dirty guys, he's touch, I mean, touching them and washing them. Very intimate, very close. Like, if you come up here and start touching my feet, I'm going to kick you. Like, don't touch me. And yet with these disciples, he's washing their feet in an act of love. And he's saying to these disciples, I have loved you. I have served you. And I'm about to show you the extent of my love by being nailed to a cross and dying for you. I've told you that I'm going away. I told you that if you love me, love one another. I've told you not to be troubled. I told you now keep my commands. If you love me, you'll obey all that you've heard me say. And I try to imagine what it was like for these 12 men with all different personalities, all different backgrounds, these 12 men to hear this from Jesus. I mean, if Jesus looked you in the eye across the table at Chick-fil-A and said, if you love me, keep my commands. What would that feel like? What would that experience be like? What would you say? What would you feel? How would you respond? I think I would say like, Jesus, I like you, but I don't love you. I think I might say, Jesus, I respect you. I want to follow you. I believe in you, but I'm not sure I can say I love you. When Jesus says this, he is saying to them, I love you, and I'm demonstrated that I've loved you. I'm going to keep demonstrating that I love you. Now I want to know what your response is to this love. Do you love me? And I'm not sure. Again, man, love is reserved for my spouse. Maybe for one or two people, I don't give love away very easily, and I certainly don't give love away without intellectually processing and thinking and rational process of whether I believe or not or I'm going to follow. I might believe in God. I might fear God. But love God? I'm not sure. Maybe another way of framing this is, does God love you? I mean, just look at that statement. What would you answer? Does God love you? I mean, is it true that he seriously looks at me and he loves me? How? If he really knew me and the things I've done in the past and maybe the things that have been done to me, the God of the universe loves me, I, I don't think he loves me. I mean, that's what I wrestle with. I think that's what many of you wrestle with. But what if? 
the God of the universe really does know everything? What if he really knows your past, your present, your future? What if he really knows your actions and your attitudes, the things you do in the dark and the things you do in public in front of everyone? What if he knows all of that, those dark secrets that you never want anyone to see or know? What if he knows all of that and he says, I love you? That's hard to believe for me. I know it's hard to believe for you because I go, there's no way. There's no way he really could love me. And I think one of the very basic reasons we don't think we can love Jesus is because we don't think he could love us, that he really does love me. Because if I did believe that, how would that change my life? If I really believed he knew everything about me and he doesn't want to get rid of me, he's not grossed out by me, he's not like weirded out by me, but he actually sees everything and he loves me. What would that be like? How would that change my life? And why is it that that's hard to believe? I think it's my sin and my shame that it's hard for me to believe that God loves me because frankly, it's hard to believe that anybody could love me, right? Like, some of you got married, and you're like, you thought for sure your wife was going to leave you at the altar. How could she possibly love me? How could one person love me, let alone the God of the universe? And every time somebody does something nice for me, someone looks me in the eyes and gives me a compliment, I kind of look away, right? Oh, shucks, no, you don't need to say that. Why? Somebody does something nice for me, buys me a gift, or takes me out to lunch. No, no, you don't have to do that. You don't have to open the door. You don't have to help me. No, 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 no. Somebody actually looked me in the eyes, straight up center, and said, I love you, Joe. I look away. Why? We all do. Because we can't fathom that someone could like us, let alone love us, And if that's true on a horizontal plane, what about the God of the universe? How could he possibly love me? Yet Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Translation, God doesn't need you to clean up first before he loves you. He doesn't love the future version. He doesn't love the past version. He loves you. Right where you are, right how you are, he loves you. Check out what Max Lucado says. Fascinating. He says, we honor God the most by letting him love us. Just stare at that for a minute. By saying, God, you love me? How would your life change if you welcomed that kind of love into your life? It's so disorienting. It's so out of this world. It's so crazy because I'm all about performance. God, I'll earn your love. God, first let me do this and this and this, and then I'll let you love me. I say that to the people around me. I'm going to perform, and then we can have a good relationship. We're transactional in relationship instead of going, wait, you love me? And that love is what begins to change me into someone different. But unless you can recognize this love and experience this love, unless you see this grace and this mercy is so far from anything you could earn, so far from anything you could produce, so far from anything you could transact with God, but it comes at you in Christ. He says, I love you so much that while you're at the worst of the worst, the bottom of the bottom, or the top of the top, the best performer ever in anything, I love you all the same. You're my sons, you're my daughters, come to me. Unless I begin to recognize it, experience it, I will interact with God at a transactional basis. God, I'll do this for you, you do this for me. God, I'll earn your love, then you'll give me love. That's not it. God sent Jesus into this world to love. Will you let him love you? Will you accept the fact that he went to a cross to pay for your sins and you can't say to him, oh, no, no, don't do that, don't do that, not for me, not for me. You honor him by saying, yes, for me, thank you. I love you in return. Thank you. 
I'll welcome your love into my life today, and I will let your love change me and make me into a different person. Love is the laboratory, the context, the environment where we begin to change. It isn't begin to change and then you get love. No, love shows up first, and that's what awakens us to change. God sent Jesus into this world, and Jesus says, I love you guys, and if you choose to love me, then here's the deal. You'll show your love through obedience, through keeping my commands. Now, for these disciples, they were present to hear Jesus say these words physically. They heard these words. So if you today are a disciple of Jesus and you say, I, I do love Jesus, I want to obey him, how do you do that? Keeping God's commands requires you to hear his words, right? I can't keep his commands unless I hear him. Well, what does that look like? He's not physically here like he was for those disciples to tell me what to do. So what do I do? I have a Bible. I open up my Bible. I come to church and we open up the Bible so that we can learn and we can listen to God. I don't just wait for Sundays to open up my Bible. I see the Bible as God's communication to me. And so on Monday and Tuesday and Friday and Saturday, I can open up and I can hear. I can listen. I can learn can hear the commands of God, learn to read His words and hear them. I can join a small group where I can be a part of a group of people that are trying to learn God's Word, trying to understand God's Word, trying to obey God's Word. I have His Spirit inside me, the same Spirit that wrote the Bible lives inside you if you believe and will help you understand God's words. So as you listen and as you sing and as you work, as you're taking Bible in, you can obey God's quiet voice because His Spirit will never contradict His Scriptures. Never. So it's not like you go, well, I just have God and His Spirit and I don't need anything else. No. Loving obedience requires regular Bible intake. Following Jesus is about, I believe in you, your Spirit is in me, and I'm going to use your words to guide me to know what is true and right and good. I'm going to open your word and your spirit is going to work in me to help me to understand, and to listen, and to follow. You know, when there's sections of the Bible that you don't understand, we've, we've all been there. If you love Jesus, you lean into that section and you try to learn. You ask for help from the spirit and from other people. I want to learn this because I love you and I want to listen to your commands. Or when you get to the Bible, has this ever happened to you? Where you get to certain passages in the Bible, you go, I don't agree with this. Let's tear this page out and throw it away, right? Because this must be impractical. This is archaic. This can't possibly be true for our day. Instead of going, wait, God, you wrote these words. They have been in existence for thousands of years to guide all humanity and every generation and culture to what is true and most important. And when I don't agree with what your word says, I won't go with my feelings. I'll go with what you say because I love you. I will obey you. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. That requires hearing him. Once you hear him, though, it's still really hard to obey, right? I could know certain truths about how to live and how to act could hear it and know it, but I don't want to do it. Have you been there? Where it's like, I may consciously or subconsciously, deliberately or not deliberately, choose to disobey. Jesus knows that about us. He knows that we can't obey or we don't want to obey or we fail to obey. So check out John 14, 15. Again, he says, if you love me, keep my commands. Verse 16. Here's what I'm going to do. I will ask the Father, and He'll give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. Skip down to verse 25. Jesus says, all of this I have spoken while, you're still, while I'm still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I 
have said to you. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. But guys, I know that's impossible, so I've got another plan. I've got something else at work. It's just going to blow your brains. This is going to be incredible. I'm not going to be physically present with you. I can't possibly be physically present with everybody that wants to obey me. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have this incredible plan. And to understand this incredible plan, there's really important theology, but I just want to use your imagination for a moment. So, so imagine God the Father, zoom way up, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Are you ready? They're hanging out for eternity past. I don't really get that, but they love each other. I'm not sure what they're doing, but they're hanging out together for eternity past. And they go, you know what? The best part about our love is that we get to share it. So they decide to create a world, but they knew in advance that when they created this world, this world would rebel against them. So they're having like a strat ops meeting and they're just getting together to kind of think, okay, how are we gonna deal with this? We're gonna invent a world, they're gonna rebel against us. When they rebel against us, should we just blow them up and start over? No, God the Father says, we're not gonna do that. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna rescue them with love. And here's what I want you to do, son. You know, they're, they're having this strat ops meeting in the beginning of time and they go, okay, son, here's what I want you to do you're going to become a person and you're going to go and walk among them and you're going to show them love. You're going to live love, you're going to speak love, and then you're going to have to die. And Jesus sits up a little bit straighter, right? You're like, what? And he's like, yeah, you're going to have to die. It's going to be really hard, but here's what's incredible. You're going to die for them, but then you're going to rise again and this is going to give them access to me and forgiveness forever. See, because love isn't looking past sin, it's paying for sin. And Jesus pays for sin on the cross so that those who everywhere have a choice to accept the sacrifice of love and be forgiven or reject this sacrifice of love and be forsaken. And Jesus goes, okay, God, I'll do it. I love you so much, I'll obey you. And just picture the Holy Spirit. He's over there going, whoa, 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 what do I get to do? What do I get to do? What do I get to do? And God's like, I got an assignment for you. You're going to be the behind the scenes guy. And you're going to help all this happen. You're going to come over the Virgin Mary and she's going to be pregnant with the son. And you're going to live inside the heart of the human son to empower him to obey me and to do everything I've called him to do, even when it's incredibly hard. And then, when he comes back to me, I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you so that you can illuminate, show people, give people understanding. Those who are not physically present are going to hear about the Son, and they're going to go, this is impossible. But you're going to, in your illuminating power, put on display the goodness, the grace, the love of Jesus so that people would believe. And you're going to go then and be another advocate to help them to love me and to obey me. And your job is to, be, to come alongside them. Your job is to be their truest friend so that when they're discouraged, you can comfort them. And when they're stubborn, you're going to convict them. And you're going to remind them of what is true because you are the spirit of truth. And God the Son and God the Holy Spirit go, God, we love you. Father, we love you so much. We'll do exactly what you say. Jesus knows that obedience is not humanly possible, so he tells his disciples God's loving plan. If you love me, you will obey my commandments, and the Holy Spirit will be your truest friend to help you, to remind you, to give you the power to obey me. You see, the Holy Spirit is not some mystical ghost. He's not some warm feeling. He's the third person of the Godhead who's been sent to reveal this loving relationship with God the Father and to give us the power and the strength to do what we can't do. I cannot obey God, but His Spirit can help me. So just in case these guys are checking out at Chick-fil-A and they're not paying attention anymore, Jesus says this three times to them. If you love me, you will keep my commands. Verse 21, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. 
Then in verse 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. And he adds, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. What's your point, Jesus? If Jesus had a love language, you know that book, Five Love Languages? If Jesus had a love language, here's what it would be. Obedience to God is the greatest evidence of a relationship with God. Lots of people say a lot about whether I trust God, I believe God, I follow God, I have this religion, this practice, this tradition. You might even say, I love God. But do your actions show it? Do you obey God? That's the greatest evidence that you love Him. And if that makes you feel convicted right now, if you're going, dang, I I think I do love Him. I do believe in Him. I do trust Him. I want to love Him, and I know I'm not obeying Him. You know that's good news if you feel a little bit inside right now that goes, man, I'm messing this up, because that's the Holy Spirit at work in you to guide you to what is right and true. If you love Him, you will obey Him, and if you haven't been obeying Him, and you sense that, you go, God, forgive me. God, change me. God, help me. And he promises he will come alongside you. He will not leave you as an orphan. He will enable you and empower you and encourage you to help follow him again. Jesus says in verse 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them. Look at this statement. Jesus in the same paragraph says, we will come to this person and make our home in them. All that cosmic goodness of love and power wants to live and make a home here? Wow. It isn't just about when you die, whether you go to heaven or hell. This isn't fire insurance. This is the God of the universe wants to live and make a home, nest, be in you and around you and with you in love and peace and comfort and joy and guidance and obedience in incredible ways that you can't even fathom. The God of the universe wants to make his home with me? Wow. If you love him, you will obey him. And if you hear that and you go, I love him, I want to obey him, talk to him. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to empower you. Ask him to cleanse you. If you hear that and you go, ah, I don't love him and I'm not going to obey him, then I think in some ways that's good news too. Here's why. Because you probably don't know Jesus yet. And I'd love to introduce you to him because the most incredible love and grace and mercy, peace, power and hope is available for you today without your performance, without your religion, without a transaction, just I believe. And that entrance of love and forgiveness and Holy Spirit, the power that comes inside you, will change your life forever. Do you love Him? Let's pray together. This is bigger than our minds can comprehend because I have a hard time believing a person will love me, let alone someone I can't see. But love is the context, the environment that we all change. You first loved us so much that you made us. You loved us so much that you give us choices. You loved us so much to not throw us away, but to come to us and rescue us. You love us so much that you give us a choice to follow you or to not follow you, to obey you or to disobey you. Your love is that wide, that deep, that long, that even when I fail and fall, you love me and you invite me to come back to you, to repent and to change and to grow. You love me so much that you give anyone who believes your spirit to make your home inside us to help us navigate any struggle, any temptation, any joy, or any sorrow. 
God, help us to accept your love today and allow your love to change us into obedient sons and daughters who with joy follow your commands. I pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen.